Jury selection is expected to begin this morning in the trial for a Waukesha, Wisconsin man who drove his car into a Christmas parade that killed six people and injured more than 60. The defendant, Daryl Brooks, is representing himself in this trial. It's a decision his own mother says is a very bad idea. She called her son unstable. We've seen evidence of that in his initial court appearances. He faces six counts of first degree intentional homicide along with 70 other charges. Jury selection, uh, again, getting underway uh, momentarily, is, is scheduled to in Wisconsin. Opening statements later this week expected. The defendant's mother is speaking out about the trial. She sent a note to the judge urging the judge not to allow her son to represent himself. And she also talked to Court TV affiliate WTMJ. She didn't want her face shown, but take a listen. In eight handwritten pages, Don Woods made her plea as a mother to the court. Why did you decide to, to write that letter? I wanted to help Daryl. I knew that he was not mentally capable of presenting himself as his own attorney. Woods agreed to speak with us, provided we not show her face. She says she's received threats since her son was accused in the Waukesha Christmas Parade attack. What has led to Daryl's behavior? His mental illness, not being medicated. Woods says her son should be in a mental hospital, but Brooks withdrew his insanity plea earlier this month. And just this week, a judge decided Brooks is articulate and intelligent enough to represent himself. And he always says, you know, Mama, I'm fighting for my life. And I said, I know that, baby. But we have to look at reality for what it is. What is it? You know, I said, you did do what they said you did, even though it wasn't intentional, but you did, you know? And you're going to have to go to prison. Daryl's not an attorney. How do you think he's going to handle the proceedings? I'm going to, and I hate to say this, you're going to see manic, full-blown. That's what you're going to see. Are you going to try and talk to him before the trial? If he calls me, I will. I tried talking to him on Tuesday again. Wood says she won't be attending her son's trial. She already knows the verdict and what her son did. Has to say anything to the families impacted by this? I have written a letter to the families. Well, and again, I give my condolences. My heart goes out to each of them. I ask God to give them strength. I ask God to give them peace and comfort them. Mm. Oh, heartbroken mother there talking about her son who has opted to represent himself at trial. And again, jury selection starting today in um, Milwaukee, the Walker, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, the Milwaukee area. Let's bring in Ed Bull. He's the Marion County attorney in Iowa and retired homicide detective Ken Williams in Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts. Ed, this doesn't... You know, when we watch Daryl Brooks in, in a couple of the pretrial proceedings, he's disruptive, he's not listening to the judge. He is, um, I would say it's fair to say, this is not gonna go well um, on any level. And, and starting today, he'll have the opportunity to potentially ask potential jurors questions. I mean, this whole thing could blow up within hours, uh, let alone days, and, and the odds of it going all the way to the end are almost zero. Well, your thoughts on what we're gonna witness, how it's going to play out and, and what the remedies could be for the court if he uh, disrupts the proceedings. Ted, I think you're exactly right. There is zero chance that this case ends in any way other than a mistrial based on what we've seen so far. Now, we could be completely surprised. This gentleman could, could absolutely keep it together. But as you listen to his mother and you realize the demons of mental health that he's dealing with, the chances of that seem slim to none. And it appears Slim is walking out of the courtroom. Now, with that being said, you know, what is the judge supposed to do? I'm a little surprised that we don't have standby counsel in this matter. And perhaps that's just not a mechanism in Wisconsin, because traditionally you'll see defendants sometimes change their mind midway through when they're defending themselves. 
or you'll see the fact that the defendant uh, acts inappropriately and the judge has to take some remedies uh, in an attempt to uh, keep the trial moving forward. I mean, I think the most important thing to keep in mind, Ted, is that as a prosecutor, we want to try a clean case. We only want to try this case once, and we want to make sure uh, that the process has the appropriate decorum that it's entitled to. And oftentimes, prosecutors, I think, when we say this, a lot of people are surprised. We want the defense defendant to have the very best attorney they can possibly have so that we know that our concern about them getting a fair trial is being adequately protected. I would be terrified as a prosecutor in this case because not only do you have one of the most high profile cases in your entire career, in addition to that, you have this problem of trying to what is going on here and is the judge acting appropriately? So I agree with you, Ted, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Ken, Ed rep uh, referenced a mental illness and in the eye of eyes of the law, he is capable of standing trial because he understands what happened, he understands the proceedings. But in reality, he, he seems to be exhibiting some forms of mental illness. What is the reality on the streets as a homicide detective in, in, in the difficulties that law enforcement has on a daily basis dealing with people who are suffering from mental illness on some level? It is, it is a reoccurring issue, is it not? It, it is, but it's also important to put it into context that there there are many people who may be mentally ill but don't possess or don't act in such a way that causes uh, you know people to fear them or, or causes them to be a danger to society. Um, usually, um, from the law enforcement perspective, it's mental illness plus alcohol abuse or drug abuse that you know somehow adds an element of violence to it. And then that becomes problematic and becomes a criminal um, type of situation. Daryl Brooks has had a couple incidents in the courtroom already. Let's listen uh, at, at one of them where the judge was trying to get him to calm down and, and pay attention. Um, here's what transpired. Mr. Brooks, we have to continue with this hearing. I'm not worrying about me. Don't put your hand on me, dude. Nobody put their hands on you. Yeah, yeah, they better not put their hand on me. Okay, Mr. Brooks, you need to look at me for a minute, okay? Why? The mission, all this political stuff y'all got going on? Mr. Brooks, I'm more concerned hey, about... Don't touch me, dog. Uh, Stay seated. Stay seated. All right, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back after lunch. I'm not going to do this with him right now. He needs to be here. He's not cooperating. I'm going to give you the warning, Mr. Brooks. I will give you the I will give you the warning that if you continue to interrupt when we when we go back on the record, you will forfeit your right to be in the courtroom today. I can't have these interruptions. I want you here. It's been a long day and a half. Put your hands off me. We'll come back at 12:30. Get me. Ed, just a small version of that in front of the jury is going to be a problem. Without question, it's going to be a problem. The question is, is it a mistrial or for this judge, is it going to be reversible error when the inevitable conviction comes down rendered by this jury? You're right. Just one of those outbursts and the ability uh, that a juror may very well feel unsafe based on his demeanor, his behavior, especially if he's able. We're not going to have deputies standing that closely to him when this trial is ongoing. And so oftentimes you'll have jurors who simply don't want to serve because they're concerned about a defendant lunging across the room or, or into them. Uh, this is a very, very difficult situation. It's a worst case scenario for everyone involved in our criminal justice system because we recognize his right to represent himself if he is competent and he understands the risks and dangers. But at the same time, we have so many victims, families in this case that want to have their opportunity to have their day in court, have their loved one respected and this process respected. And Ted, you're right. This is going to be a very, very tough trial to actually get through without some type of mistrial. Ken, from a law enforcement standpoint, um, you can't have, I mean, if he's representing himself, uh, he will be, you know, dressed in street clothes, a suit or what have you. And you can't have him shackled because he has to be able to move around the courtroom. You can't have, as Ed pointed out, three deputies standing uh, uh, over him. But you also have to protect the family members who are going to be there testifying. You have to protect the judge. You have to protect everybody. Um, it's a, 
I would think, kind of a security nightmare. I know they have different ways of you know handling it with the remote control shockers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when you look at this, um, what kind of trouble do you think uh, could could um, happen here in this courtroom, and, and how complex could this security aspect of the equation be? Yeah, I mean, you know, the judge is in charge of the courtroom, and you know, we have to respect what the the judge is trying to do here. But at the same time, it, it does seem to be that there are going to be logistic issues, uh, you know, from the outset. And you know, I don't, I'm not sure what it is that the judge is seeing that is not maybe sending this gentleman out for an evaluation, a mental evaluation from, you know, someone who's a um, medical person to go and get some sort of determination on his fitness. But you know, it's going to be it's going to be problematic from from the from the start. Yeah, and this will be a case I think uh, that'll be talked about and uh, uh, looked at it because it is so glaring. You know, you have levels of mental illness. We've had people represent themselves, even recently here on Court TV, represent themselves. And there's a different sense of anxiety in that courtroom when that happens, and this is going to be through the roof. Our team is in place there again, jury selection uh, beginning this morning. Still ahead.